Yeah, let's do it. Sounds good. Great. So welcome, everyone, to our session where we talk about, Joe and I, we talk about taking OpenStack from zero to production. Uh, my name is Amit Tank. I am a senior principal cloud architect. I work with companies like Cisco, EMC, and uh, lately with uh, DirecTV, which is now a proud family uh, member of AT&T, uh, in working with uh, really large-scale cloud products and uh, uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, also have led teams to take OpenStack into production. Yeah, I'm Joe Sandoval. I am with uh, Lithium Technologies. I'm the director of the cloud platform engineering team there. I've been involved in OpenStack since the Portland Summit uh, at a previous job, and at Lithium, uh, it's where we actually had a chance to really get to production. So I think I've kind of seen uh, you know, quite a bit, and hopefully today in this, uh, in this talk that we can kind of share some of the things that we kind of learned, and as well as like, kind of like give you some strategies and ideas of like, you know, what you can take away to be able to kind of get yourself from zero to production. Thank you, Joe. So we have a very interesting guest speaker uh, lined up later in the session. And uh, while we're talking about this topic, uh, there are some really interesting insights that we wish we could have uh, learned uh, earlier in the stages when we were probably running through these cycles ourselves. And so we hope that uh, people uh, in the audience can really benefit and take home some uh, solid uh, ways to mitigate and maximize uh, your chances of success. So with that said, I just wanted to have a quick, uh, by a show of hands, uh, informal survey of uh, how many people are in the process of introducing OpenStack within your uh, organization or are planning to introduce OpenStack for production purpose in the next 12 months. Wow, that's very good. That's very good, Joe. Yeah, looks solid. OK, so without further ado, let's dive in. Uh, so when we talk about OpenStack, there are ways to introduce OpenStack within your organization. And there are ways to strategize around your POC. Some options are going to work better for you versus some other options may or may not work uh, uh, as optimal for your organization. Our focus is to uh, look, look at it from an architect's point of view. If you are in a Fortune 500 environment, what are some of the different ways that you think, Joe, people could uh, maximize their chance of success? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, there's definitely, you're going to be, you know, dealing with kind of like, uh, you know, identifying like what that audience that really would be the best use case to kind of help you kind of prove it out, you know, especially because you're going into some environments at that scale that, you know, there, there is silos that you're going to have to be challenged with. And, and here you are going to try to come in and, you know, you're going to be sweeping across like storage, network, you know, compute. And, you know, so you're going to have challenges with security. So, you know, what, what I really found in like in my current job and as well as like my previous role because when, when I tried to introduce it there, I mean, it was a disaster. I mean, I really, I mean, I was very wide-eyed. I was very optimistic of like the, the promise of OpenStack, um, but I just really wasn't was ready for the, the cultural resistance that I was going to face. So, you know, some of the really prerequisites that I would really like strongly encourage is that, uh, you know, is your organization, or is your automation like really dialed in? That, that can play like a really big key in regards to like how that initial kind of like kickoff that POC can be. As well as like, you know, are you trying to really retrofit something or like trying to bring things that um, are kind of like a brown field versus, I, you know, I like to look at like starting off with like a green field on that initial POC and then, right. you know, worry about those complex use cases later. Right. Very interesting uh, uh, thoughts there. So I, I think uh, one of the key things that I've learned uh, uh, in different uh, projects in these are knowing as an architect, knowing what are some important problems that you can solve for your organization is really the key. OpenStack has lots of things to offer. However, is that really what your company needs to solve? Your company could be like the best uh, rocks maker in the world. Uh, are you trying to, say, bring DevOps into your organization, say CICD, which stands for Continuous Integration, Continuous Development, or say something like self-service, or say more scalability? So I, knowing what problems you're trying to solve really goes a long way. Uh, a, great, uh, a great point about uh, basically strategizing around how you approach it. One great thing that we've seen in, uh, in our recent teams is that when we do small, like we start small and we create internal success stories, our chances of success are actually maximized. Uh, people, you, you build your own advocate. So for example, let's say if, if you had your own end-to-end -end testing team and you were trying to introduce OpenStack in that contained environment, that's a better way to approach if, if you're in early stages of uh, OpenStack adoption, rather than trying to uh, overcome it or kind of trying to project as OpenStack as something that does it all. 
So the great thing about OpenStack is that it uh, allows, if you manage perceptions, it allows you to uh, be applied in a very pointed way. Yeah, I th well, and, and I think, you know, at, at Lithium, I mean, you know, we, we kind of went through like really like three iterative cycles. And I can say like that first one, it kind of rhymed, reminded, or it rhymed with hit show. It was just a disaster. You know, we really didn't go into it with like a real strong strategy of like what we were trying to do. Uh, you know, the implementation, like the, you know, the, we had like a vendor that really helped us kind of like get that implementation up, but it, it wasn't really like the right hardware. Like some of the things that we, we learned from like the virtualization journey, we, we just didn't think about like, are we using like the right hardware? Was it the right, you know, infrastructure to kind of like, you know, was it going to support what we were trying to do? And, and then basically, you know, our developers who experienced it just had a really negative opinion about OpenStack. And, you know, and just to be transparent, we're, we're, we're a strong consumer of public cloud. So, you know, we're really being rated against that. So, you know, we really had our work cut out for us when we kind of like moved into like our second and third iterations of, you know, getting these successful POCs. That's great points. Yeah. The, the, uh, one thing I would really like to emphasize on is that understand what resonates with your executive leadership. They are probably trying to solve certain business objectives. As long as you can align your OpenStack value prop within those objectives, I think you'll be in a decent shape. So moving on to the next uh, topic, and I think Joe and I, we have discussed about this very passionately before. Uh, you have distro versus upstream options, and uh, we, uh, there are various ways that it, uh, that's going to impact your cloud strategy. So I'd like to share an interesting uh, perspective on this. There are definitely a lot more healthy number of options today than there were, say, two years ago. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there are all of these are great options. Personally, we've had uh, some great success with Mirantis. Mm -hmm. uh, the implications of going pure play open stack versus not has really very interesting uh, considerations that you, you'll probably need to think about. Are you really going to, how, how important it is for your organization to avoid vendor lock-in? If you are going with a custom distro, down the line, if you need patches and you need to, say, uh, adopt this uh, very widely across your operations, across your uh, different organizations, do you, are you going to need a support net like of a big technology partner to build, in, uh, build plugins around your automations or, say, allow you to consume OpenStack in a very uh, customized way? And so those are some of the considerations that uh, you'll probably, as an architect, you would want to think very early on. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of have to say, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm with you on a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of me, though, is like when I, when I think about like, you know, with these choices, and I agree with you, like when I really was trying to like, you know, position it to like executive leadership and like what we were trying to do, there was a lot of spend. And, you know, that's, that's one thing when you, you know, it's never agile when you're like t coming in there and asking for $500,000 or a million dollars to like try to get something done. And, you know, it's very like, and from that level, seems unproven. But yes, we, we kind of went the same route. We're like, we, wanted, we knew there was going to be some levels of vendor lock. Mm -hmm. And we also knew that we had some levels of support that we were going to need as an, as an organization. You know, the, the great thing, though, is that we, we've seen this, like, a lot of the learnings that are, like, starting to trickle into, like, the distribution. So what, what I'm really interested in now, as I'm seeing, is that you can kind of pick really varying levels of, like, how far you want to commit. You know, if you really want to play a conservative, mm -hmm. you know, we're seeing some great options where, you know, there's like blue box where you can be like, okay, I, I really don't want to dip too far in. Like, I wish there would, there would have been really quick ways that I could have, you know, enabled us to like really see, is this the right thing for us? Uh, you're seeing other distributions that are very like community driven, like they, that they've taken the learnings of previous, like a TCP cloud, you know, where I, I've been very impressed with kind of like how these companies are going in there and packaging and really like reflecting some of the best practices into the distribution because, you know, when you get into some of these vendors, you'll realize like there is the benefits of, hey, they, they're testing it, they're making sure things are working, but how committed of it, if you find a bug, and like, we all know that we have to be conservative in like a Fortune 500 environment about like, you know, moving too quickly. You don't want to like disrupt the business. So if you find like there's a bug and there's a fix, are they going to backport it into your distribution? You know, right. so we've kind of been on like both sides of it. So it's, it has been uh, something that I'd, I definitely would have like, you know, I wish I'd had that insight when I first went into it. Great point, and I totally ag agree with you that you have to, you're better off being conservative when it comes to being on the edge for ecosystems like OpenStack. If you're on the edge, it's great in terms of feature parity, but you're also exposed to a lot of noise when it comes to bug fixes. Neutron is a great example. Lots of great bug fixes have gone into uh, Kilo release and Liberty release. Yeah. So, okay, great. So moving on to uh, our next topic, which I think is a personal favorite of mine about uh, integration with your legacy subsystems and why it matters. And uh, when, we, when, we, when we've talked about this in past, uh, we've always uh, 
uh, seen OpenStack as how, uh, what are your chances if, if you are introducing OpenStack as a graded gradual path of adoption within org organization, or are you introducing uh, OpenStack as a switch the flip approach where you are gonna demand your company to build an entirely parallel environment and then have all of the workload move to that, migrate to that environment mm -hmm. as a switching the flip kind of like one shot thing. And the, the graded approach I think in my opinion is really uh, an approach where you can like basically integrate with key subsystems like LDAP, Active, Dir uh, Active Directory, IPAM, DHCP, DNS and so and so forth. And it also allows you to watch out for caveats. A quick great example, when you take OpenStack in production, let's say your Active Directory has like 6,000 users or typically for, uh, a Fortune 500 company may have thousands of users. Uh, what we've run into is like uh, the Kilo version of uh, OpenStack, the Keystone algorithm, it tries to scan uh, anytime when you integrate with a 6K uh, Active Directory user uh, database, it tries to scan through the users and anytime any operations that you try to do in the cloud, it slows up significantly. Or simple things like your security people are gonna have a very opinionated approach to the Nova creds mm -hmm. that are uh, stored in plain text in your open RC file. Uh, your IPAM plugin support or your NATED. So those, those are kind of the caveats that as an architect, if you uh, anticipate them and mitigate them before they become an issue, you're gonna have much better chance at your OpenStack uh, adoption. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I agree with you and I, I think I would actually kind of extend, you know, the integration. Like, yes, you know, you, you definitely should be really figuring out like at what point do we, you know, do we have to integrate certain features? But it, I think it also extends in regards to like, even like in your, your design decisions, mm -hmm. we, we kind of wrestled this like with our, like our third iteration where we kind of were, we had some really aggressive timelines you know, a lot of interesting things happened along the way as well as we went through this journey. Um, but we were, we have, a, you know, we're software as a service and we have like really extremely tight SLAs. And as ideal as I was and the team was about like really committing to like everything being open source, being software defined, you know, we, we hit some challenges. Uh, you know, last year, you know, uh, Lockheed and my team, you know, I really challenged them. We had two really big, big things in regards to like, you know, what we were going to do for like SDN. And then as well as kind of like we were having some like storage challenges and you know, we really wanted to make the storage really work, but our, our block use cases were, were very strict. So, you know, we really kind of came back and realized like, hey, you know what? There is still a place for some of our existing legacy environment, such as like, you know, what we were doing with like storage. So we actually had to integrate, you know, some enterprise storage in there that would help us to be able to really meet, you know, those block use cases. Mm -hmm. We also realized like, you know, yes, we wanted load balancing as a service initially, but we really had some timeline, so I'm like, look, let's make sure that that 80%, that that is like rock solid. Let's, like, let's, let's just nail it on the compute storage and network. Right. Then, you know, but we said, you know what, we, 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 we have so much automation happening in our F5, it's so integrated into our application that I was like, you know what, we, we'll grow into it, we'll allow those, those projects to, you know, to mature, right. and then at a certain point, we can start strategizing like, you know, how do we introduce these things, or even possibly like allow our vendor to kind of catch up, so we've been very vocal to you know, our vendors who handle our load balancing saying, we need you to integrate into OpenStack. These are the type of things, we need your APIs to be unified, you know, with Neutron. So these are things that I would say, you know, pick and choose where you decide to, you know, you know commit to. If you don't have those type requirements, great. Right. But I, I would kind of like defer to be a little bit more conservative on that side. Great point. I think I, I love the part where you basically emphasize on pick and choose. Uh, a great example is uh, as soon as you put OpenStack in production, you're gonna hit this, you're gonna have this meeting with uh, your ops guys where Today, OpenStack uh, security group isolation is actually achieved by IP tables, where every entry is an IP-based entry, whereas your uh, firewall security team is more than likely to be using DNS for their wildcard uh, fire, uh, firewall rule base, and so that's gonna be a big disconnect. Personally, we had to mitigate that as well. Yeah. Uh, a few other examples that you already covered very nicely. I quickly want to mention this, that this is where OpenStack really shines. I mean, we've had the OpenStack Foundation, which, is, which has done an incredibly job, incredible job, like things like Project Navigator that just went live two days yeah. ago, uh, where you can actually take OpenStack and turn off certain capabilities so that you can allow your company to gradually adopt it. If you don't need Horizon, great. You can just consume uh, OpenStack APIs so th uh, through some meta scaling like a cloud management platform and still continue to use your existing infrastructure. And that brings me to a great uh, 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 depiction of what a typical cloud would look like. 
And this is really where your uh, uh, OpenStack use case shines, that you could have a Neutron plugin mm -hmm. where you would have an existing legacy cloud, uh, so to speak, yeah. still work with your OpenStack as a control plane. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, you know, you know, definitely, you know, a strong approach. I know we, you know, we kind of skipped the virtualization journey, so we kind of went from like bare metal, you know, into into cloud. So interesting. You know, there, you know, and so definitely, you know, we didn't face some of the same challenges you guys did at Directv in regards to like that mm -hmm. having such a big, strong, you know, large uh, ESX environment. Mm -hmm. um, but there still was like you know some challenges that we had to face in regards to like how we provisioned and how we like enabled our you know our our, our internal customers to be able to like self service our product. Very interesting point. When you say internal customers, do you also have like customers that are external customers using consuming your OpenStack cloud? So we, yeah, we, we look at it two ways. I mean, we, we obviously have our, you know, we have a, over 100 engineers that mm -hmm. you know we're, we're onboarding into into OpenStack, and this really like powers like our software. So okay. you know it is it is you know 80 percent of like what our software as a service is is driven by that. Very interesting. Okay, so let's move on to the next part. Uh, so what challenges to expect? Cultural and otherwise. Uh, Joe, you want to take a first shot at it? Well, I'd, I'd like to think that everybody's like on board with OpenStack like I was when I first really just found out about it. But, you know, when I first was at my previous company and brought it in there, you know, it definitely was challenging. Um, you know, and, and I think part of it was just, you know, we were, we were, trying, to dig, we were trying to do too much um, at that time. So, you know, I kind of blame like, you know, we, we should have been a little bit more, you know, more focused in regards to like what we were trying to do. Um, but, you know, I think, I think, like I said, you should really just try to be and anticipate like some of those challenges, like mm -hmm. really try to onboard and bring people along with it. You know, it's a journey, I think is like the really big key that I've kind of got out of it. You know, we had to kind of like, we, we started up when I came to Lithium mm -hmm. and, you know, we, we had an approach where we were trying to like really bring in like our existing teams. And it was tough because, you know, you're, you're fighting fires every day, but here we're also trying to like get OpenStack up and going. And there's a little bit of learnings that were happening there. So you know, we eventually decided that we really kind of needed to bring in like a, a separate team to really get it to be production ready. And then what we started doing is really started really, you know, communicating out, really educating, getting people really to consume the cloud mm -hmm. um, internally so that, you know, we could really get them all on board to, you know, you know want to learn more about it, want to be enablers in the business and really would seek out like, you know, engineers that were really like Lighthouse customers that, right. you know, they could be our best advocates for like what we were doing there and, and right. really understood the benefits of like, Hey, I'm no longer waiting for like two months to like get hardware provisioned or dealing with some of the challenges of like of all the snowflakes that we were building with bare metal. Uh, they were really like starting to see the benefits of like how we were automating the cloud and what it was offering to them. Great. No, I I, I resonate uh, with so many of these points that you just uh, shared about because we we've, we've traveled we've taken that same path and we've traveled through those milestones ourselves. Uh, one of the uh, litmus tests that I like to use is uh, the toy maker test. Having OpenStack introduced in your Fortune 500 environment, let's say you are a toy maker company, do you really have to turn into a technology company in order to consume OpenStack? If the answer is yes, then maybe you are taking a suboptimal approach to it. Ideally, OpenStack, adopting OpenStack should not necessarily be projected as something where you have to maintain an army of engineers. You have some great options of partnering with vendors, really great technology vendors. So no matter how, if your primary focus is, say, selling uh, uh, tra travel uh, uh, itineraries across the world, your company should be able to focus on that primary objective while your technology partners allow you to uh, come up to speed with an OpenStack infrastructure. A, a great example is, if you have teams sitting on, let's say your app owners, individual app owners within your company sitting on six to eight months of validation data on a legacy cloud infrastructure, if your approach as a cloud architect is to go and tell them that, hey, your validation, test validation is invalid because now you'll have to run on KVM, then that's probably going to be like, it's going to hit resistance and it's going to be suboptimal. Uh, if you give them uh, an option of still continuing to sit on the, their choice of hypervisor while still consuming OpenStack in some capacity, that maximizes your chance. And your biggest ally here, and I, I'm very fortunate to have some very uh, phenomenal executive management and leadership. Sunil from my team is sitting in the audience as well. Mm -hmm. They've given us really like on a weekly basis, they ask us very tough and pointed questions from a technological point of view. So when it comes to these kind of caveats, how can we solve these uh, challenges using innovation? So whether it's uh, making two hypervisors work with OpenStack or uh, growing skills organically, doing internal boot camps and so on and so forth. Like basically the approach is that as an architect, you'll have to turn into educator. 
-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you there, especially because like, I mean, we all know like the, the, the talent challenge is, 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 is apparent. And, you know, it's, it's great to see the, the foundation kind of create like these education paths, but, you know, it's still going to take some time for a lot of that to start really trickling down into organizations. So, you know, we, we've done the same thing. We've, you know, even as I built a team, I look at kind of like the composition of like what we built. We have some with strong networking background. We have other guys that were very great at, at tooling, you know, strong Linux, you know, internals, externals that, you know, these are, these are what the guys that we brought in. And I really was very strategic about finding individuals that, you know, there always was going to be an easy answer. Even with having, having like, you know, support, you know, there still was going to be some things we're going to have to power through. We, we had to bandage some things. We had to kind of like find some hacks and workarounds. And, you know, definitely, you know, we, you know, we were, we were woken up in the middle of the night a lot, a lot of times trying to figure things out. But over time, that, that domain knowledge started to spread. And now, now what we're doing is like we're able to like really recede and culturally really kind of like build like our next generation of individuals who are like helping us to be able to support the production cloud. Very interesting, very interesting. Yes, organically growing skills which maximizes your chance of success. I totally agree with that. So moving on to the next part. So uh, OpenStack, when you put into production, it's, it's a strange beast where you really, your chances of uh, success are going to uh, be uh, maximized. If your operations team, your lab admins, your L1, L2 support, all of them are somewhat at a fluent level when it comes to OpenStack ecosystem. It's not going to happen overnight. But are there certain approaches that you can probably uh, take? And there are, there are some really, you, you mentioned earlier about the OpenStack certification. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with you that the foundation has done uh, a phenomenal job in like, promoting this uh, awareness where education is seen as a primary channel of mm -hmm. uh, basically opening up the knowledge within sure. OpenStack. And so uh, like how Cisco did with in 90s, they did with certification. Like everybody who was network certified when they moved on to their organization, they would be much more uh, welcoming to incorporating those technologies. And so down the line, hopefully, we'll have lots of engineers and architects fluent with these kind of certifications, where when they go in their respective Fortune 500s, OpenStack is not seen something as an alien technology. Mm -hmm. It's something seen as a very uh, approachable, very, very, very friendly technology. Yeah, you know, I, I would I'd probably pause it. Like, you know, the one thing that I, I really have gotten out of like this, this whole journey is, you know, I've consumed open source projects, you know, over the years of my career, but I think like the OpenStack community has done a pretty amazing job in regards to just really helping me to understand like what it is to be part of this community, what it means to like contribute back. And it, it was baby steps. I mean, that, that really was, you know, I, I, I really didn't get it. And now, now I've actually kind of grown my team to where we're like, hey, let's help other operators. How can, you know, we ran meetups, like let's, let's just share everything, whether it's like good or bad, like we want to really kind of get it out there. Now it's really interesting to see that, you know, we're in the SF Bay Area and, and now we see like these great operator meetups where like we're like we're engaged with like, you know, companies like Visa, Workday, you know, Walmart. We're like you're, you're hearing other other stories, you know, we're connecting on Slack channels. You know, we're finding ways to kind of like strengthen each other's knowledge and help each other like overcome like scaling mm -hmm. challenges or like pointing out like, hey, you know, guys, have you seen the same things like that we're seeing? So, right. I, I mean, that's the one part that I really appreciate about being, you know, being on this journey and being part of the community. Very interesting, and I totally agree with you that yes, it's the it's it's having that sense of ownership when you have those people and that a sense of community where what you do helps others, and you you get to learn from others' uh, experiences, and I, I think that's really the uh, big value prop of OpenStack, and uh, I, I I couldn't agree more on terms of uh, when you you mentioned about like your experiences on how uh, you you organically grown skills as well as like you found these like uh, pools of talents to tap into. That's, so, that's how I met you uh, like at the, the Vancouver the Summit. Vancouver Summit, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's a great uh, example. And so uh, another great point is if you want to uh, uh, help your company succeed in whatever business you are in uh, uh, while using OpenStack as your cloud infrastructure project, these summits are a great way. Like the, uh, the foundation as well as the community does a great job in connecting individuals where you get to really uh, uh, collaborate with each other, and and that's the real spirit. And I I, I think I'll, I'll uh, emphasize on this point about like looping in various stakeholders within your company is a great key point. Uh, we've learned that uh, getting ops guys involved in the stage in the uh, at the appropriate stage is a great way to make sure that everybody is on the same page in terms yeah. of. Uh, open I'd, I'd actually say you, you got to take it further. You probably I mean I, we we've been very adamant about like not only among like our users but like 
even above me, even when we had challenges, like when we had to like make quick pivots, mm -hmm. you know, because we had been out there and very transparent, right. that, you know, we were able to have that, you know, the, you know, the, the, the leadership support in regards to like some of the decisions that we had to make. So I can only emphasize the importance of being very transparent and communicating up, but then also like, you know, set the milestones, make them very clear mm -hmm. so that everybody can see like, you know, your market, you're, you're tracking towards your KPIs. Great, absolutely, great point. So, are you excited about the next part? Yeah, sure, it sounds good. Yeah. Okay, so when you talk about uh, this session, it's really taking OpenStack from zero to production, right? So we have somebody in our uh, audience today, uh, a, a great guest speaker, who really personifies the topic of our session today. If you were to think, I mean, based on so many different experience with Fortune 500 in finance sector and various different things that Joe mentioned about as well earlier, taking a big uh, blue chip cornerstone institution uh, company from a state where there is no open source presence to it becoming a very, very uh, fluent with open source, uh, open stack like kind of project and becoming really champions in this uh, ecosystem is as significant of an undertaking as you can imagine. And we have Toby Ford today among us who has actually done this with phenomenal success. So we are going to invite him to the podium to share his insights and wisdom with us. Thank you so much, Toby. Thank you, Amit and Joseph. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about our, our experience and how it reinforces what was just described. I think they did a great job at, at calling out a lot of the issues that you have going from zero to having something in production. <clears throat> in our, at AT&T, we started our journey with OpenStack in 2010, 2011. Uh, we did a lot of testing, compared a lot of the com uh, competitive offers of that time whether it was Cloud Stack or um, Open Nebula, and then obviously a lot of our own internal tools. And we, did, we had to do a lot of work to bring people together that could actually help to make this happen. And we brought a, a live production environment up uh, in early January of 2012. And so since then, we've been operating OpenStack. Uh, and it's been a long journey of many, many lessons learned, and I wish uh, I had sat through this presentation at that time, because I would have learned, uh, probably would have had avoided many of the obstacles and mistakes that were made along the path. But clearly, you know, finding the right partners, finding the right uh, group of people that can, you can work with to make your vision real is essential. Uh, I can't reiterate that point more. Uh, finding the right talent and retaining that talent has been very difficult. Uh, for us, we've gone through a transition of two or three different time periods and teams. Uh, sometimes the folks that we, we spent a lot of time bringing in, uh, they disappeared. Especially at a large company, it's very difficult to keep people around when, it's, when there's a lot of bureaucracy and there's a, a lot of challenge, a lot of brownfield, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of processes, a lot of people, politics, et cetera. So it's something, really to focus on is how do, you, how do you keep people engaged and interested? And thankfully, I think the OpenStack project has been, been very helpful this way because uh, so much innovation happens in this area that it allows us to attract and, and keep people engaged, w whether it's externally or internally. And a lot of the, the mojo around it, how well it's grown, the continual sort of evolution of the project uh, from from its start to the now the big tent and uh, a lot of the new initiatives we have going, I think that's been very helpful to get uh, and retain interest. Uh, now, that said, also, you have to be able to scale. And for us, we've scaled from a small number of sites in 2012 to now uh, we're in the midst of deploying 70 locations. Um, we expect to, to deploy much more than that in the next two or three years. So. That transition has really required us to be able to scale the teams, and then we've ended up having to use a partner, Marantis, uh, to help us to do that. But also we realize more than just paying somebody to, to help you, it's about really help getting the community to help you to work uh, your issues and, and solve your problems uh, and participating. So it's both a give and a take. There's enormous opportunity to, to get and learn lessons from events like this, from the documentation, from the various sources, IRCs, and et cetera. But it's also an opportunity for, you know, 
for us to take our expertise and apply it back. And so we've been trying very hard to, to do more contribution, and you'll see a lot more of that coming here soon from AT&T, a lot more of our uh, researchers, PhDs giving back, try to balance the equation there. So again, I can't reiterate more than some of these uh, points that Ahmed and Joseph were talking about as we've gone through this process. Um, you know, the, uh, when you're building an environment like an OpenStack that involves um, storage, networking, and compute, you want to make sure that these things are solid. And you want, one of the big, biggest pieces of advice I would give anyone is to think about it in the future. What, what does it mean to have an environment? One, oh, getting it installed and set up is one thing. But then two years from now, wh what do I have? What is it going to look like? How many, how many different apps or VNFs are going to be running on this platform? And wh how, what kind of uh, pulls and pushes are you going to get out of the, the customers you have or the, the business internal business units? What's going to be pulling you? Try to think out in front uh, and try to be proactive about what, what that would look like. For us, we've had enormous amounts of tr struggle dealing with migrations and upgrades, setting expectations and such. So the biggest piece of advice I have is try to give yourself as much runway as possible to get something stable and solid. The basic componentry of networking, compute, and storage working absolutely perfectly solid and expand from there. Because if you go into it with too many things fluid and not, not you know, iteratively being developed and not really uh, rock solid, then that can cause an enormous amount of pain downstream. And so we've tried many times to try to inject new networking mechanisms in the middle of a production environment and try to uh, make enhancements and try to produce really quick change. But that's uh, having the base part solid and stable is, is really essential because at some point you start getting so many customers that they weigh heavily on you and they pull you in many, many directions. So you, you have to be ready for that. And so having the uh, stable, solid base is one thing, but also thinking about the processes about managing service assurance and managing the customers that you have is essential as well because at some point you will be overwhelmed by the number of requests coming in. And you have to have a way to, to break out of the sort of conundrum of, of solving people's day-to-day -day problems and always being in a fire drill. So I would recommend really thinking ahead and trying to be proactive about uh, what you're setting up and be ready for the onslaught. Because it's very easy once it gets started for many, many people to spin up many, many different things and it, it, can, get, it can get overwhelmed very quickly. So I think that's pretty much the main things is just be ready, be proactive, and then have something solid to start with and iteratively build from there. So. Thanks. Thank you, Amit. Thank you so much, Toby. Uh, it really speaks to the, the, the charisma and the uh, prowess that uh, Toby lends to the entire ecosystem so that architects such as ours, jo Joseph and myself, like we can have somebody to look up to and uh, uh, really follow that footstep to making your success story stand out when it comes to OpenStack in your company. So thank you so much, Toby, again. I appreciate that. Great. Joe. Sure. Um, so with that, then they, we're uh, open for a couple questions if there's any out there. We are also planning to uh, share some of the great uh, uh, tools, uh, things that we've picked up here and there, like things like uh, connecting your IRC and Slack so that you can still attend your uh, Sunday 2 a.m. OpenStack meetings on your Slack, on your phone. So we'll, we'll post some of these guides on super user blog post. A great guide is like uh, setting up an OpenStack cloud on a single bare metal node. Uh, when you do POC in your company, you'll probably have to do like many micro POCs so that like when you want to do a demo to your CTO about scaling up Nova Docker as a hypervisor as well as like your KVM hypervisor, you'll probably need to try that out on your own. And so there's some great guides that we've probably come up with uh, to deploy OpenStack like production on a single bare metal node using uh, Ubuntu. Yeah, and then one, one other thing, like tomorrow we'll be talking with, like I mentioned earlier, like some of the, the operator meetups that we have in NSF with some of the like, large scale implementations. Mm -hmm. um, there'll be a few of us tomorrow with, from Workday, you know, from Walmart Labs, from Visa, 
we'll all be like, you know, talking a little bit more about like some real, some real like real world problems that a lot of us are facing. So that's tomorrow at, I believe, 440. Great, I, and I would definitely recommend. I've attended some of these kind of uh, conversations, and operators uh, meetups are really great at understanding some of the caveats, which you're never gonna learn in any books, any guidelines, uh, any OpenStack guides, unless somebody has actually gone through them and mitigated them technically from a technology point of view. Uh, this is a great way to learn about those. So thank you for okay. sharing that, right. Joe. Appreciate thank you. that. Okay, great. Well, if anybody has any questions, we are open. And otherwise, feel free to pull either one of us or anybody uh, offline if you want to pick our brains into diving more deeper into strategy or technology, whether it comes to Neutron plugin or it comes to multi-hypervisor or uh, unified OpenStack plane. Uh, we are more than happy to help in any way we can. Okay. Yes, we have a question. Great question. I'll quickly repeat the question. Uh, the question is about uh, working with different vendors. Do you have you found uh, a, a trend where people want a s single vendor for your storage, or they are okay with going with multiple different uh, storage vendors? So, Joe, you want to take that? So, what we did is we actually um, kind of like you know because like I said, we we have we're a product of like we're a company that existed for about 15 years. We've had two acquisitions. We have some engineers that are very familiar with with AWS. So instead of like really focusing on like specific versions of like what the storage is, you know, because we didn't want to get into that, um, we did found it was important for us to like do provision IOPS. Um, you know, there was we obviously wanted to like be able to, as I mentioned earlier, deal with some of the challenges of like noisy neighbor as well as like we needed like QoS as well. So that was more important to them to know that they they had that. And actually, we were really we actually anticipated it, and that and we didn't even like wait for that to become a problem. We were just I was just like guys. This is not going to work. Like all our performance testing and benchmarking was showing that we were going to break SLA. So we we went and we were like proactive about it. So that's a great question. And coming from a storage background myself from EMC days, uh, I can speak to this question where uh, today the the customers are being very savvy, where they want to focus more on their software because, as a very wise man once said, software is eating everybody's lunch. And so uh, when they look at it, is they have a legacy vendor from like the XYZ storage box. Whether or not it can complement on a software side to help you define your software-defined storage. If the answer is yes, then they are better off sticking with that single vendor. But if there is uh, uh, a different vendor, say a startup, that gives you a better software strategy around your storage, then you'll see customers going for that with an abstracted storage around it, so that you can change, keep changing your gear, gear, but still you have your business layer uh, stay stable. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you so much.